So in our last lecture, we talked about force, work, and power. And we talked about how Newton's first law says that if we've got something, uh, let's say we've got that ball and it's on a flat surface uh, and it's, you know, it's moving at, let's say, five meters per second, then it's just going to keep rolling forever unless some type of a force is, act, is applied to it. Now, this is really not an intuitive concept, as I said before. So the theory before Newton uh, was actually a theory called impetus theory, and it was developed by Aristotle. And the impetus theory said that things generally move They've got like an impetus, which is kind of like an internal energy sort of, uh, and they move until that impetus runs out. So they move until their, their energy sort of just runs out. Now, of course, that theory is not correct, but in some sense, that theory is a lot more intuitive because in the real world, things move until they stop moving and everything eventually stops moving uh, in the real world, at least on Earth. So if you push that ball, eventually it will stop. And why will it stop? It will stop primarily because of friction. I also, to a lesser extent, air resistance, but uh, in this case, we want to talk about friction. So let's say we've got this hockey puck on ice. So the hockey puck is on ice, and let's say that's a flat surface of ice. So let me go ahead and fix that. And uh, the hockey puck, of course, is going to slide on ice, and it's going to slide for a while uh, until eventually it comes to a stop. And it comes to us, the fact that it comes to a stop means that there was a force being applied to it, and that is the force of friction. So the force of friction, here we get to another equation. The force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force. And actually, when we do coefficient of friction, we do it lowercase, so we do it like this. So what are these variables? Of course, this is the force of friction. So let me write that. And then this is the coefficient of friction. And this is the normal force. So let me explain the coefficient of friction first. Coefficient of friction is generally a constant. It's generally a given value. So it's something that you have to research and uh, you can find tables of coefficients of friction. And it's a constant value for two given surfaces that are touching each other. So. Uh, for example, if you slide that hockey puck on uh, on ice versus trying to slide that hockey puck on asphalt, you know that, of course, the hockey puck is going to slide a lot a lot more on ice, and uh, it's going to slide a lot less on asphalt. And that's because the coefficient of friction between the hockey puck and ice is a lot lower than the coefficient of friction between the hockey puck and asphalt. For two given surfaces, so for example, in this case, it might be rubber and ice, the coefficient of friction is uh, is a constant, right? So again, this is usually going to be something that's given. And uh, the coefficient of friction is unitless. It doesn't have units. And then the normal force. So what exactly is the normal force? Let's go ahead and discuss it over here. So if you've got a block, right, and it's the block is on a table, we know that there are either no forces on the block or all the forces that are acting on the block are balanced. So what might be some forces that are acting on the block? Well, we know that gravity is acting on it. Right? Gravity always acts in the downward direction. So assuming the table is fully horizontal, uh, gravity is going to be acting fully downward. And so, of course, if we want to figure out what the force being applied to the block is, we can use the equation F equals MA. F equals the mass of the block, which we'll say is 3 kilograms. 3 kilograms times gravity, which, of course, is 10 meters per second squared. And so, in this case, the force of gravity on the block is... 30 newtons. So that is to say 30 newtons downward. But the block is not moving. And so that means that there is an equal and upward force acting on the block that is also 30 newtons. Right? And that's the case for anything that is at rest and is experiencing gravity, right? It has a force that is equal and opposite, that is upward from the surface below it, that is pushing on the object up. It's, it's that's not very intuitive. Again, we don't really think of it that way, but it, but it does actually make sense because otherwise the thing would be sinking into the floor or into the table, and so that means that there has to be a force, uh, again, equal and opposite, pushing up on it, and so that force is what we call the normal force. Normal force, and so it turns out that of course we can use the normal force in our equation, right? And that's uh, of course this value over here. And so the normal force times the coefficient of friction gives us the force of friction being applied to the object. Now, this is a special kind of friction. 
that we call kinetic friction. This is friction that always acts in the opposing direction of motion. Right, so the thing is being pushed this way, and so friction always acts in the opposite direction of motion. So for example, if we've got a ball that's falling, friction is acting in the upward direction, right? For an airplane that's flying this way, friction is acting in the opposite direction. So again, friction is always acting in, you know, opposed to the direction of motion. But kinetic friction, of course, is the type of friction that has to do with things that are moving. Now, there's another type of friction that we call static friction. So static friction, we'll write that down here. So static friction is actually a pretty intuitive concept. Uh, I always think of, for example, if you're trying to move a refrigerator, right? Refrigerators are very heavy. And let's say there's a refrigerator on your kitchen floor and you're trying to push the refrigerator. You're trying to give it a shove. So you're applying a force in this direction. But what happens when you apply that force, when you push the refrigerator? Initially, of course, you, you start pushing and, and nothing happens. The refrigerator doesn't move. And so you increase your force and the refrigerator still doesn't move. And then at some point, it suddenly starts moving, right? So why didn't the refrigerator move initially? What was happening? Well, you are applying a force in this direction. So let's say you start by applying 10 newtons and uh, you apply 20 newtons and then you increase it to 30 newtons. And in all of this time, the refrigerator still doesn't move. Why doesn't it move? There has to be an equal and opposing force being applied somewhere. And so this is the concept that we call static friction. So if you are applying this force, that means static friction is going to be equal and opposing, again, also 10 newtons, and then also 20, and then also 30 newtons. And so it turns out that static friction can be calculated using the equation F is less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction. Let's zoom in a little bit. Times the normal force. So the equation is very similar to the equation for kinetic friction, but we notice, first of all, there's a different coefficient. So the coefficient for static friction it would be different than the coefficient of kinetic friction. But then second of all, we've got this less than or equal to. And that reflects the fact that what's going on here, right? It's opposing the force you're applying. So when you started applying 10 newtons, it, it also applied 10 newtons, then 20 newtons, and then 30 newtons, and it opposed it. Until, let's say, you, st you started applying 40 newtons, and now the refrigerator starts moving. So at this point, what that means is that the force of static friction we'll say is less than or equal to, maybe we'll say 30 newtons. So once you apply more than 30 newtons, the thing starts moving. And once the thing starts moving, now we're not dealing with static friction anymore. Now we're dealing with kinetic friction. And kinetic friction is typically less than the maximum, is typically less than the maximum amount of static friction. So again, when we wanna do static friction, we're using this equation. And static friction will continue to oppose any kind of motion. So it opposes the force that you apply to it until a certain point when the static friction, of course, reaches its limit, and then the thing starts moving, and then we switch to kinetic friction. So this is the concept of static friction. This is what we should really understand for static friction. So let me zoom out. So in this lecture, we talked about the force of kinetic friction. We talked about the normal force and how you want to calculate the normal force. Again, it's equivalent to the force of gravity, just in the opposite direction. And then we talked briefly about static friction as well. And so that's all we really need to know for friction. For the practice problems, I'm gonna give you guys some practice problems that ask you to pair this equation with the equation F equals MA. And uh, when you do that, you could kind of set them equal to each other or you could use the equation separately. And uh, from that, for example, you can, uh, this is the force of friction, then you can plug that into this equation, right? And so this allows you to figure out how the force of friction is going to accelerate or decelerate an object. And so that's all we want to know for friction for the MCAT.